on behalf of myself and the co-authors, thank you all for inviting us to the session. And uh, it's, it's, it's been a really cool session thus far. And I also want to thank the previous presenters. And in particular, a number of you have actually presented like photographs of journal entries and, or, and, uh, and photographs of, of the people you know, from 150 years ago doing archaeology and stuff. And I was so worried that my presentation would people would be like, why is he showing us these journal entries? Who cares? What's wrong with this? So it was, it's very nice to see. So thank you. Um, so as archaeologists with the project Tales of Bronze Age Women and Tales of Bronze Age People, both led by Karen Fry at the National Museum of Denmark, who again is giving a keynote tonight, um, we do a lot of primary source archival research in our work. Um, as you may imagine from the titles of those two related projects, um, both funded by the Carlsberg Foundation, much of our research begins and sometimes ends in the Bronze Age archives at the National Museum of Denmark. So we're actually quite lucky in this regard because the archaeological record archives at the National Museum house one of the most comprehensive national collections of original archaeological documentation in the world and certainly the most extensive records detailing the rich archaeological history of Denmark. Um, more specifically, the Bronze Age reports in that collection date back to the mid-19th century, including accession information collected and collated since as early as 1806, and many of the original reports um, date to at least the mid-1800s. The museum has, as you can imagine, a rather long and important history in, the in archaeological thought, especially in Europe. Uh, in fact, um, the museum's first director was none other than the antiquarian uh, Christian Thompson, uh, an early proponent and pioneer in the development of the now pretty ubiquitous three-stage, three-age system that we archaeologists still use today. Um, so here are some file cabinets. Uh, I had to explain that, yeah. Um, the archive houses the original excavation documents of much of the archaeology done in Denmark for the last 200 years, uh, from journals and personal notes to site sketches and maps, to letters and correspondences, and even including shipping manifests, expense receipts, and even some postcards, as we've seen uh, in some places before. So here, I would just like to share with you some examples of the cabinet in the archive. Um, each drawer here contains, on average, anywhere from 50 to 100 original reports, um, composing probably around 60,000 individual documents. So there's a lot of stuff. Um, beginning in 2018, in our use of the reports housed um, in those very cabinets, it, it, it became very clear very quickly that many of the original and entirely one-of-a-kind documents um, were quite damaged and deteriorating. Uh, so my colleague Samantha Ryder and I began working with our co-authors and our boss uh, and other museum staff to implement a strategy whereby we could begin to systematically digitize and organize um, the reports as we were accessing them, um, beginning notably selfishly with the specific reports that we were consulting at the time. Um, our earliest efforts were more of a systematic undertaking of a very unsystematic sampling strategy. So if we needed to look at this report, we were gonna digitize it, um, but we weren't doing it you know, in order or anything like that. Um, and to give you an idea of what some of these reports look like, um, here we have a couple of pages reporting on the excavation of a Bronze Age burial mound um, dated 12th November, 1846 by A. Strunk and C. F. Herbst. Uh, most of the report, and certainly the earliest ones, are absolutely beautifully handwritten uh, with site and artifact sketches uh, similar to this. I often kind of just sit there and just stare at them. I, I don't know why, but I've just fetishized the, these, uh, these journals because they're just beautiful. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, given the advanced age of many of the records, um, as an American, I think these things are archaeology in and of themselves, um, but we were born like yesterday. So, um, so here are some other uh, ran just random pages from uh, a another report by Shrink. Um, this one from 1845 and another from 1862. Um, you can see the level of artistry involved as well as the level of detail. 
In many of the cases, these notes and illustrations are literally the only written record of these finds. Um, and you can also see in a lot of these how um, the images are starting to deteriorate and weather and, uh, and such. Um, here are some notes from the 1863 excavation of a rather famous Bronze Age burial mound at Jägersburg Hain, north of Copenhagen. Um, I always I'd like to point out the, uh, the wonderful sketch by uh, C.H. Jorgensen, um, but in these examples you can also see the, the damage that's occurred over the years to these originals. They have coffee stains on them. Um, they have all kinds of problems and stuff. But the, the, the reports themselves are really cool. And they tell interesting stories about even the people that, that made the reports. Um, here we have a sketch of what the original excavator thought the individual in this mound must have looked like, including having a beard and, and, and everything. So um, I, it, it's, it's pretty funny. This, this uh, close-up from the same report shows the warrior from Jäger's Walk Hang, uh, as imagined with, from the grave good positions. Um, in the grave. Um, to the right are illustrations from the Inan Kirsten volumes in 1975, or 1973, showing the artifacts that were actually recovered from that grave. Um, this warrior was buried with weaponry and numerous bronze items, including a quite unique large bronze disc, which, which was actually covered in uh, gold sheeting, and which is a part of the, the um, existing Bronze Age displays at the National Museum in Denmark. So here are two, um, two similar pages from the works of Wilhelm Boy, uh, sketch maps from the famous Gullhoi site, uh, excavated in 1897. Um, you can see similarly to some of the, the British reports that, that we saw actually in the very first presentation, um, just how detailed the, um, the sketch maps and stuff are. And they are absolutely invaluable to our understanding of these very, very early works. So here we have, uh, a letter um, by J.J. A. Warsai from 1861 discussing aspects of the Trinkhoi and Kongshoi mound excavations, even including a receipt that was uh, sent with that letter to the National Museum. Um, not only written works can be found in many of these, these reports, uh, but also never before published sketches, as we can see, see here. Um, these artworks are also kept in the file folders, um, and like this original pen and ink drawing from the same report, um, we get an artist's rendition of actual textiles and stuff that were found in the excavation, and we wouldn't have access to those otherwise. Um, I apologize for the pictures of old white men in hats looking at middle-aged white men in hats <laughs> doing work, uh, but I didn't take the pictures. So um, Again, these are from the original excavations at Goldhoi. Uh, we have photographs taken during the original dig in 1891. Um, here we get a glimpse of two of the three oak tree coffins that were discovered in that mound. Uh, the largest has been dated chronologically to 18, 1389 BC. Inside this coffin were recovered numerous grave offerings, including the remains of a folding chair, a bronze dagger and an axe, a bronze pin, two wooden bowls, one with ornate decorated uh, uh, tack designs, as well as a birch box um, and a horn spoon. The kilt that we just saw was also inside with the remains of two woolen caps and uh, some other textiles and leather fragments. But many of the reports also include photographs just like these. These kinds of materials are absolutely invaluable to our understandings of early excavations and the contexts of the finds, um, especially for those digs conducted prior to the hopefully more rigorous standards of modern excavation methods. Uh, other photographs, including more recent images, like this one to the left, um, of a bronze sword from a double grave at Karlstrup, uh, excavated in the mid-1960s. This artifact is not displayed at the museum, and while the photograph itself is not as irreplaceable, per se, as some of the earlier photographs that we just saw, the report images nonetheless provide a valuable visual record of archaeological materials that most people, including museum staff, will never lay eyes on. So additionally, the archives also house an extensive collection of original artworks commissioned by the museum for publication, such as this watercolor and, and uh, ink illustration of a bronze sword dated to 1884. I apologize for not giving credit to the artist. I can't read it. Can't read it. 
Um, here are some examples, similar to some that we've already seen, of uh, original pen and ink drawings of Danish Bronze Age daggers from the artwork cabinets. Um, and at the right is just one of many boxes of excavator journals held in the archives. Um, this one containing the personal journals and unpublished notes of JJA Warsai, uh, with the top notebook dated to 1881. Uh, here's another example of some, some archaeological sketch maps. Um, and uh, I, I really hope these just illustrate you know, how important these documents are to being able to actually recreate the archaeology that was going on even 140, 150 years ago, that, that these kinds of archives, um, just they're irreplaceable for us. So, um, and, and this is not just a part of the Danish legacy of archaeology, it's part of a greater European archaeology and cultural heritage. And these, these materials are significant to our understanding also just of the Bronze Age in general. Um, so for doing archaeological research, access to the full range of information in these records is, as I said, invaluable, as the minutia that one can uncover uh, within the reports themselves is sometimes astounding. Um, for example, these are images of Hufgrup woman, who was also on display at the National Museum. She was a, a Bronze Age female um, buried that, uh, with, uh, in an oak coffin and ended up having uh, immaculately preserved textiles with her, including an absolutely amazing hairstyle <coughs> Um, and some, some gold artifacts and earrings. My colleague was doing research on this, um, on the gold earrings in particular, and was trying to, to see if we see in Denmark a correlation with similar artifacts, for instance, in Central Europe. Um, and so she needed to look at how, um, how accurate were the museum displays on exhibit um, to the way they actually were when Schuster Pullman was, was actually uncovered. And so she was able to go back into the archives and find original sketches and original images from when they literally pulled the textiles off of this woman to see that her gold uh, coils were in a place indicating that they were very similarly uh, placed to the Central European ones, probably over the helix of the ear instead of through the ear. Um, just that kind of detail that you can find. Also, uh, one that I really love is going, going through one of the reports, there was a note by the excavator saying um, that while they were looking at the mound and the farmer uh, was showing them what, what, uh, what he had uncovered, they looked over and realized that the guy's cows were drinking out of a wooden trough that was made out of a Bronze Age oak coffin. Um, those, those little kinds of things are just great to know. Um, but so we were just happily and slowly digitizing these reports every couple of weeks as we pursued our, our own research and various research agendas. And then as we've seen and we all know, um, in September of 2018, the National Museum of Brazil in Rio de Janeiro burned down. Um, sorry. Um, and this tragedy opened our eyes to similar possibilities, God forbid, in Denmark. Um, so we have since stepped up our efforts and we are currently digitizing using an Epson Workforce 60,000 <coughs> scanner that was already in the archives, luckily, not being used for anything, but uh, um, the scans are always made um, on the flatbed surface to avoid any potential damaging of the originals. Um, all scans are made at 600 DPI and in 48-bit color and in orders in which the pages appear in the original report documents. Um, while these settings make file sizes rather large, the quality is exceptional, and scans are then saved to an on-site computer in TIFF format. And we chose, the, um, we, we were actually worried about choosing the, the scanner um, because uh, there are issues with deterioration of, of inks and images and stuff from the, from the scans. And luckily, as it turns out, the 60,000 is really quite good for that. It doesn't deteriorate things as much. So, uh, so we, we started digitizing the, the documents. And then Notre Dame Cathedral caught fire. And we went, oh shit. Um, this really, really illustrated just to us how none of these old buildings are safe and none of the materials in them are then safe and how easily these unthinkable events can completely alter the archaeological record. Um, so now uh, we're continuing to work with the National Museum colleagues to make sure that the digitized materials are saved and stored properly. Uh, each file is saved using a file protocol um, indicating the, the National Museum's existing location numbers, um, recording for county, district, and parish, 
making each image ultimately linkable to a relevant accession information and other related documents. The TIFF files are converted to text searchable PDF formats and combined into a single PDF document uh, to facilitate file compression and backup um, once uploaded along with the original TIFFs together as a, as a file folder. Uh, these files are then uploaded to the National Museum's online archives on Cumulus, which is a cloud-based storage platform. Um, so then they're kind of safe. Um, once on Cumulus, files are linked by accession number to other relevant files, such as artifact photographs and descriptions. And in the future, we hope to develop a volunteer-based crowdsourcing scheme uh, similar to those developed elsewhere, such as at um, uh, the... British Museum has done an amazing job with their Bronze Age collections um, doing the same sort of thing. So this may eventually facilitate things like translation and interpretation of many of these documents, the vast majority of which are in Danish uh, and often in Danish cursive, uh, which makes it very easy, to, difficult to read, especially for me, because I'm not Danish. Um, so makes reading them problematic. But we also hope to work towards making access to the digital files themselves more readily available to researchers, as well as the general public and to the international community at large. We are currently, well, get back there. Sorry. Um, we are currently running this project on a volunteer basis, uh, but we would love to extend it towards a more concrete strategy um, and a best practices protocol, and to also work towards digitizing other materials in the archive. Uh, not just the Bronze Age reports, even though we do that selfishly. Um, but of course, another issue to consider uh, that we all do is funding. Um, we don't have any. Um, and so if anyone has any funding ideas, please come see me. Um, and uh, that said, we welcome any ideas and suggestions for streamlining this process as we move forward. And uh, thank you for your time.